Okay. Sure. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to session one of, well, perhaps, I don't know what session is. Is it, it session one? It's session one, yes. Session one of Uncurated, uh, led by Professor Stephen uh, Heidenreich. Heidenreich. Sorry, <laughs> funny uh, German name, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, I think we should start a lesson right now. I'm going to pass the mic to Stephen. Okay, thank you. Um, but uh, who, who, who was speaking right now? Was it, was it, no, was uh, taken? No. No, that was Flavio. That was Flavio, okay. Yeah. I, um, well, I would say that we start, I start, I start with giving a little bit of an outline of what the seminar is about and what we're going to do. Then I posted a link to an other pad that, uh, which is something that I usually use in all in all the seminars to take notes and um, take notes and coordinate uh, everything. Then, but I would I would like to know who is out there and what is your what is your ideas that you that you are that you're most interested in the, uh, in with the seminar. So. Um, and just to get a little bit of a glimpse, who's 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 out there? Um, who wants to start? Just to say, just to tell a little bit about yourself. What is your background from from where you're coming? Uh, what is your interest in the seminar? And um, so that I know. Okay, ter Terence is yours. See you then. Uh, does anyone wants to talk? Uh, hello, can people hear me okay? Okay, um, yeah, no, I said yeah. I just tested because I'm on mobile data, so it hopefully will remain constant. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, greetings from uh, Belfast in the north of Ireland. Um, I'm actually just here for a short while. I'm actually based in Berlin, um, so I am a writer and thinker and artist and all those kinds of labels. And I guess my interest in taking the course was um, uh, Stefan, you've done a lot of uh, very interesting work in terms of you know economics and also how that's related to uh, culture. So, and particularly like the against curating uh, papers uh, mm. is really interesting. So it seemed like I am interested in, um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess um, cultures of display, and mm -hmm. uh, because of this, uh, I think that you know while I and I've said this with uh, Maria, who takes a lot of these. Um, Courses uh, that you know, I don't, I don't hold much uh, faith or hope for anything in contemporary art as it stands. Um, but maybe this class can offer mo new models for uh, actually giving some hope. For um, so yeah, that's just me. Okay, cool. You're based in you're based in Berlin. Yeah, I I I moved to Berlin uh, about a month ago from uh, Leipzig. Because I'm also based in. Okay, I'm also based in Berlin. Oh, okay. Well, we'll probably yeah. meet some. Let's let's meet for a beer at some point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's cool. Um, great. Um, who wants next? I, I can do so. I'm Eduardo. I live in Mexico City, and I make experimental films. I am also interested in, in experimenting with like gallery films i guess so i read th what the seminar was about so i got really interested in this idea of curation so that's why i'm here okay mm -hmm. mm. are you studying at an art academy or what's relation what's your relation to the art world let's say or is there any apart from doing the gallery, gallery films um i do watch a lot of shows i guess i go to museums and i have some like experimentations with like interdisciplinary approaches but i do mainly films but okay yeah cool okay mm, who wants who wants next uh yeah taken do I do I hi do I pronounce your name right, Tegan or? Yes, you do. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Tegan. Uh, I guess a little bit about me. 
I am currently working a lot on uh, kind of investigating Afrofuturism as political philosophy. Um, and I've been working, I guess, on a few kind of uh, shorter articles on uh, just art history in general, um, with a focus in more contemporary uh, new media work. Um, I don't really have much of a relationship to the art world, uh, at least yet. Um, I hope that at some point, at some point could be a point of entry, <laughs> but I don't currently attend um, university uh, and I don't really have, <laughs> um, I don't really have <coughs> interaction with uh, artists right now, um, just in general, so. Yeah. Can, can, we tell, can you tell me where you're based? Which oh, yeah, I'm based in Kansas City, Missouri. Hello? I, I've never Kansas City because I know I only oh. I only travel the more or less the east coast or the west coast of the states. But okay, that's good. Okay. Great to have you here. <laughs> So then there's Apijan and Esther. But Esther is going. Esther is going on and off. There seems to be something wrong. I would say rather with the connection. Uh, Apijan, are you Hello. here? Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Um, yeah. yeah. There's, there's um, be a... Whoops. Mm. There, there were two voices now. Whoops. No, I was just wondering hey. what problems Esther had with her connection. Esther's this jumping in and out no? Uh, so yeah. Yeah. let well maybe we can but you tried to you tried to ask her and she didn't reply so I don't know um, well let's continue with Abi, Abijan and then hopefully we figure out uh, okay. okay she's just talking um, okay. Abijan can you can you hello. Uh, say a little bit about yourself hello can you hear me? Sorry, Hello. Uh, connections a bit spotty. Mm -hmm. I can hear you. Uh, okay, great. No, hi, I'm Abhijan. I'm, an ass I'm, uh, well, I'm a professional curator, so I'm assistant curator of the Dhaka Art Summit at the moment. And you know, wh while I'm taking this course, I'm actually typing out a curatorial essay. Um, but of course, I was very intrigued and interested in by you know that you're a very seminal essay. So I was very. I mean, that's kind of what led me to want to attend this course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, cur I'm currently I'm like I, I work across South and South Southeast Asia, so I'm currently in uh, Bengal. In where? Uh, Bengal in India. Ah, Bengal. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm. And you're working as a curator in Bangalore, or you're you're already curating in 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 India? I work as a curator in the, at the Dhaka Art Summit in Bangladesh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, Dhaka. Okay, I didn't. I didn't get the. I didn't. I didn't no, no, no. understand the name of the of the city. Dhaka. Okay. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Um. So then we have Meredith in and somewhere lost. Uh. Meredith, are you, can you hear me? You want to tell something about you? But now. No, Meredith is off again. <laughs> okay. Mm, well then, I would say, uh, as there, we we still we, we keep going, mm, and hope that Meredith and Esther will come back at some point at some point soon. Mm. Okay. The whole. I mean, some of you read my read the essay that I wrote last year, uh, not last year, this year, some of this year. Mm. And uh, Mosa Lemi, um, well, Meredith, are you back? Can you hear us? You want to say something about your, uh, about yourself and where you're coming from so that everybody knows who's in? Sure, um, hi, my yeah. name is Meredith. I hope the background noise is not too bad. No, it's uh, fine, it's perfect. Okay. Um, I run a um, an a uh, crowdsourced apparel company. We do a lot of artist collaborations and mm -hmm. events like DragCon. We experiment a lot with 
different modes of remuneration and economies and very interested in different ways to present artworks or curate artworks. So I'm really interested in this topic. Okay. Uh, uh, we, we'll, go ahead. Sure. Um, that, that, that's in a nutshell. Okay. Uh, can you tell me which city you're based in? Sure, sure. I'm in New York City. Okay. I think you were in my last seminar, if I'm, am I right? I was, I was. Okay, okay, okay. Which is a bit, which is a bit weird, maybe, that I first, I first have a seminar out on, uh, on the non-money um, topic and then something on curating. And I, maybe I should explain a little bit what's the link between the... There is a link between the two things, of course. There's a direct link and a more ind indirect link, but just... So just to for the for those who weren't here, the seminar in spring, I think it was uh, was on a non-monetary economy, and actually the book is out now, and there's also a translation of the of a part of the book out on the Transmediale website. Transmediale is a conference in a conference in, in Berlin where I'm going to present uh, that the non-money th money thing. Um, between the two, just to say that I'm. Just explain how you, how to get from fine from working on finance and working on art. I actually I'm actually coming more from the art field or from a media theory field, um, and this is also the connection, so to say, the connecting the connecting field between the two, mm, how to say the two topics, um, because uh, of course uh, to think about a non money economy uh, is something that you don't do if you if you study just pure economy, but if you look at it from a media point of view, then it's very clear that uh, money is just one medium of very many, and you can also think about a non-monetary economy. And more or less the same approach in some ways is, the, is about, is to the art world, mm, that one can approach, of course, the exhibitions um, and producing something in the art world um has to do with the cultures of the of the visible huh? um with visual media <laughs> uh to some degree we have to we have to clarify that and with the history of visual media and the history of exhibition making mm -hmm. and that is also one actually one of the reasons how the whole um uh, how the whole idea to talk about the um or to question the the matter of curating came came about. Or like um, after having seen, I think it was after two. No, it was after one. Uh, it was after the documenta opening. Um, I had thought about uh, the um, the curating um, the issue of curating quite a bit particularly because I was giving a lecture series in, at the university in Cologne. Uh, and there was one part was about the curating and I told my students that I, that I, that I may publish an article, which I, which I did, um, which I did then. And if, of course it was taken because of the, how to say, I wouldn't say impending disasters, but of the big shows, um, uh, drew. Mm. Uh, in the background, and that's not so much in the article actually. In the background of the whole thing, is a uh, stands a more to say a longer time view on the history of exhibition making that we have to talk about. Is basically if you look at the um, at the uh, pad, there's more or less. I post the other pad again. Um, it's more or less an outline of what I wanted to do in the seminar. Um, and there's also slides that I, I've i put up on a slide share that you can, that uh, we can go through uh, in the course of the, of the seminar. I mean, for the, the other bit is also, is also very, very useful for questions and remarks just for today, like, hmm. Uh, there's also there's already people there's already somebody in, uh, so I'm setting it here. Uh, 
questions and remarks. Yeah, more or less I wanted to talk about collections, the history of collection and collections today. Then there is something about the display that we should talk about in, in January. Mm, then mm, it's a bit about a theoretical background. Uh, but it's actually in the end everything is going to be a bit mixed uh, so I'm depends also on how uh, and how we're getting how we're going ahead uh, how we're getting uh, going ahead today uh, where we end up uh, but there's also for sure going to be some kind of practice part uh, because that exhibition I mean in the end of the article I kind of proposed that one should do an uncurated exhibition uh, meaning that the how to say what was what used to be the curatorial process is something uh, that is that happens in a distributed model and or in a participative model and that is and the question is how to do that which would actually mean to how to say to structure and to plan and to let develop a how to say a process of communication and there's some ideas uh, how that can be done and actually in some ways in some ways I'm already working on it uh, the the big issue for me right now is like how to you not know, given given from experiences with other exhibitions that were that were non curated like open call exhibitions the big issue is of course how do you try to get as close to an open call as possible and still uh, guarantee or maintain a certain idea of quality, let's say, or idea of, uh, yeah, I could say quality. No, quality is not, it's not really a good word. Still be respected for uh, within what is used to, what, what used to be the art world. Of course, one could say, I don't care, I don't care about the art world. But in the end, mm, the task is a little bit to how to say to remain inside and still uh, come up with a different type of practice. Um, okay, now there is a lot of then there's a syllabus, but uh, it's mostly on historical issues. And then there is that uh, if you look at the at the other pad, there's that. Uh, kind of new book out where do I have it uh, but it's not it's this one um, mm -hmm. visitor centered uh, exhibitions and art curation and art and, and, cura and, and education art museums but it's still mm, for my taste it doesn't really take the uh, new network architecture or network practices in into account, um, and this is actually very, quite quite difficult to believe that the so to say the museum culture uh, remains within that kind of autocratic uh, type of decision making and takes the position of the cura curator uh, that ground that. Um, there is a few. There's a few a few proposals how to how to change that, and actually we should we should try to collect some more or how to get beyond curating. Uh, but most of them, in some ways, in some respect, then reintroduce the practices of curating and curating by by the simple necessity to have a decision on what is going to be exhibited and what is not going to be exhibited. Um, okay, so. I think uh, best is that I start. Um, are you? Uh, are some of you able to have a look at the at the slides? Uh, did I post the? I can also post the slides here. Actually, on uh, here. Oh wow! It's happening. Who are you? <laughs> we we were we were seeing you uh, going on and off and on and off and on and off. <laughs> well, so, this is the the fantastic 
uh, seminars with the new center I really like because we suddenly froze and suddenly we fell, then we disappeared. <laughs> Okay. But uh, Esther, listen, we we had a round of everybody uh, telling us briefly who she or he was and where they're coming from and what is okay. the interest in the course. So you're the last one to join in now. Okay. Do you want to give us a little bit of details about your, your interests and where you're coming from and so on? Okay. Well, it's funny because I actually, I am an artist that um, starts with dance, but it starts actually as a as more to be more, let's say, publicly engaged as an editor when I was very young. And then later on, when I met someone that had this artist on space um, as a sort of like starting uh, explorative mode in the late 90s in London, and I joined into this whole thing and I thought, I saw the whole potential of it. It was a little bit the time of the indie enterprises and stuff. Uh, for me, it seemed very natural anyway that as artist, editor, or self publishing, etc., the whole idea will make sense. And obviously, we will invite people to talk with us and then we explore um, what could happen in the gallery space. Mm -hmm. um, what is amazing is that some of the people I met in that years end up being very important curators. <laughs> <laughs> and they be really evil uh, on the top of it. <laughs> so actually, when I when I read your your article, and it was really funny because there was all this like young, you know, like because it's so, such a hype the the whole thing. So it's all this young, you know, like people who are maybe I don't know doubters of famous artists, and they go to Goldsmiths, and now they're young curators, and it's the coolest ever thing you can ever be. And they were all like, oh no, this guy is spoiling our dream, he's telling. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yoo <laughs> So this is me. <laughs> <Let's see>. Okay, okay. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the 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 direction Berlin in Berlin to the article were, were quite were quite similar. Listen, tell me, t just to, to, to which city are you based in? Well, I am in London because I came here okay. twenty years ago, and here I'm staying. Uh, the the situation in like the the Barcelona situation, the Spain situation. Well, I am an exile, really. It's like. Uh, like uh, it's funny because now we're having again something that it it had to happen, no? But anyway, so I've been always a little bit in the crossfire between being or not being Catalan and being or not being accepted as well there. Oh, I so you're from Barcelona? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah so you you're facing facing the exit and and on both uh, on both sides now <laughs> you don't even know which one's worse <laughs> <laughs> exactly oh yo okay yeah no so, but yes but basically what happened as well is that okay that then obviously let's say that a series of things that involve my 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 professional life my private life my friendships my relations my ethics everything all this all this kind of um experience uh, and it's actually to arrive to the point of actually, you know, almost not having any job, any work, any recognition, or, you know, or a series of recognitions, but not, you know, not much active activity. But at the same time, seeing that a lot of methodology went into the hands of people who become more, um, like, as you say, technocrats, no? like, uh, institutional technocrats. Um, and a little bit like a, it seems almost like it will be like a sort of like a gentrification effect. And because I really, I always been very interested in theory, etc. And actually, the magazine I published had these intentions as well. And I really like writing. And I just so got involved into studying, which is something that I was unable to do when I was younger. So now I finish a master in research in Central Saint Martins of uh, art theory and and critical studies, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm very happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, about the about the article, I mean, uh, there's also, of, of course, there's in the background, there's also a little bit of, of somehow, let, let's say, my experience that I had with curators. I had a very, very, very short, like three or four years period where I was 
uh, doing artistic work. And that, uh, funny enough, led to working with, very quickly to work with, on one side, Hans-Ulrich Obrist. We did one project wow. with Hans-Ulrich Obrist. The <laughs> creator. <laughs> yeah, which is actually it was actually fun. Uh, yeah. But we didn't see very much of him because uh, he was just flying in, flying out. And I think yeah. some of us spoke twice with him, and I wasn't, I wasn't amongst them. <laughs> um, and the the other thing was it was an artist group. Uh, and the other thing was that we had some talks with with uh, Katrin David. It was at that time that she was doing the preparing this uh, ninety seven documenta. Wow. Uh, no. And and that was actually quite nice. And but our group uh, dissolved before the invitation could even arrive. So uh, actually, some of us then went to Documenta and did something which was which was Pete Schulz. It was two years after the foundation of NetTime, and he did he did the together with Klaus Biesenbach the hybrid workspace that was so to say the leftover of our group mm -hmm. activities. If one say. So I have some. But very brief, it was really just two years or so in the 90s in Berlin experiences with curators. Um, and of course, then I witnessed the same thing uh, that some of you might or may also have witnessed and that Esther that you were describing, that all of a sudden curating became, um, how to say, it's actually true, you're, you're right, it's, uh, there is a type of gentrification, one could, uh, one could claim it's a, it's a type of gentrification process, like mm -hmm. a gentrification of the how to say, gentrification of exhibition making, like a, yeah. a certain type of professionalization, and then a certain type of also connecting it to the to the sphere of, how to say, to the sphere of finance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every, uh, the, the, there's two things that one that one may, uh, we might, like, actually the, the, okay, the editor of the, of the newspaper, in the German newspaper that published the article first, uh, called me Two a month ago or so, and told me that mm, we may we may have to do something a follow up piece, um, because now uh, the, the, there there was a lot were a lot of debates in in German and in English, and the debates in German and English were slightly different. Uh, but one of the one of the very strange accusations that I heard in in the German debate was what was that the. Uh, that the whole article had a populist right wing tone. Oh yeah, no, no, that was like that was no, no. Es que es que wow. Bueno, pero that's very, very, very interesting at the moment because of what's happening, for example, with language in Spain and Catalonia, Spain, which is fascinating because people are actually literally using the same words and the same discourse to defend the like opposite. Uh, political leanings. So we realize that actually, again, like the whole language is totally like people um, repeat things almost like in a sort of a, a, a systematic way because they learn certain kind of things. So to talk about this level, so obviously, as soon as you talk a certain level of things, or either you get accused of being a Marxist paranoia or something, or you are a populist right wing. But obviously, you're not going to be right because uh, the thing is that they cannot accept they are neoliberal, um, absolutely um, um, in denial of a series of things that happen or mutations. So, yeah, I mean, I, of, of course, it has to be. It's our, yeah. our problem, it's not, it yeah. will be never be theirs. Yeah, I mean the whole the, the the whole discussion, of course, has to is is in has to do with the let's say the political situation that we are that we are in, and uh, how to say the, the also the whole issue of uh, democratizing cultural cultural venues is yeah. something that that so to say plays out in front of the framework of a discussion of the let's say the neoliberal fake left or the democratic real left or however you want, want to call it or the or clinton versus sanders uh, so it's the whole it's the whole question of um how do i it's a bit difficult of political privilege mm -hmm. and real democratization mm? that's yeah. the that, that's the political background for the whole idea yeah um, and of course then the the, the it's, it's very common to hear from those let's say 
privilege left uh, that as soon as one as one casts it out on the on the on those privileges that you framed as an as an um, as right wing. Mm. And that happened even in the, the editor of, my, of the site of that newspaper called me and told me I should read an article that was uh, on writing about the documenta because when the when it when it came when it turned out that the documenta left five million in debt wow. uh, is uh, well, okay um, if you if you compare it to other expenses it's like a kind of ridiculous yeah. mixture yeah. about it. Um, but uh, the end of the article then was writing that uh, one should uh, was no actually it was not about the documenta five million of debt it was it was about um, the article was about the um, a bit worst case the the Beatrix Ruf that was uh, that was left that had to leave the curating the you know, curator's uh, post at the Rijksakademie in Amsterdam mm -hmm. after it turned out that she was making half a million. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in a side yeah. job, mm -hmm. in yeah, pay so much of people. It's, it's it's funny because it's coming it's coming from different places, no? Like this information. Like I have friends who work as young curators actually in post, you know. Like and she was saying, for example, oh, you you don't know how much like the amount of money that the, the direct the director the curator. Direct uh, so institutions like the processes within, yeah. You know, it's it's very it's very and, and kind of everybody knows that 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 the, uh, that curating as part of uh, in, within its power position, of course, is affiliated with the markets. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I'm also not I'm also not even arguing against the markets. That's mm -hmm. not the point. I'm not saying that the markets are bad or something like that. That would be stupid to say. Um, but of course, it, the in the very moment that they try to cover it. Uh, or to try to hide it, and at the at the moment it comes out, then it, there is a problem, and that was exactly the problem that Beatrix Ruf encountered. And then there was an article in the in another big German newspaper, the Süddeutsche, that was saying, okay, it's actually one shouldn't be overly critical because it's kind of natural, and of course the curators have to deal with the markets and. Um, that so to say that there is that there is fringes that there's borders that they transgress or not is 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 all fine but one should um, one, one should definitely not uh, go not go down two arguments which is the first one is like the right wing party in castle that is suing the documenta for spending too much money mm -hmm. like casting a doubt on the cultural political culture and as such mm -hmm. or like and next she mentioned my article or questioning curating as such that must not be done <laughs> and so it's amazing yeah, and so she framed me within uh, within the last paragraph of her article as being okay. There's these two. There's these two that um, there's these two that work together, and it's the it's the right wing. Uh, it's the the right wing party, and it's the the ones that so to say cast populist doubt on curating as such. Oh. So now it seems it seems we're having we're having another another guest in the another participant in the seminar. Misael, Misael, I can you hear me? Misael, hi, Misael Oquendo. Um, maybe some yeah. people are in iPads, or maybe something that they are in telephone. Yeah, let's let's see because we had everybody. Well, uh, we had everybody like introducing herself somehow. Um, Misael, you could you? As last participant that joins, uh, also introduce yourself briefly so that everybody else knows who you are, and that we get. Hello, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is myself. Okay. Thanks. I uh, I live in Los Angeles, and this is approximately my third seminar at the New Center. Um. I graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, undergrad, where I studied uh, visual critical studies and film, and also did some curatorial studies, um, as well as running an alternative gallery space um, mm -hmm. in the packing district of Chicago. Um, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pleasure and now you're based. 
now you're based in LA. Yes, I recently moved about a year, a year now. And your name are probably my cell, my cell. Yes, it's like my okay. cell phone. My cell. <laughs> my cell. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, welcome to the course. Now it's Thank getting you. it's getting a bit full. That's nice. Um, we're still we're still at the introductory, let's say introductory first remarks, and uh, we were t we were chatting a little bit about uh, about the plan, what to do. You find like on the side here, you find uh, uh, this, the the link to the slides. And another link to an etherpad that I that I usually use in order to coordinate uh, mm, teaching and collect uh, collect remarks and so on. So these two links are kind of uh, kind of important. Mm. So w uh, when you joined in, we were just about the, talking about the relation of the of curating and the markets. And actually, as I will. Let's maybe just start. To, let's go on from here because that's the that's the so to say the ultimate reason for me to uh, to criticize the procedure of curating. Um, it's not so much that I would say curated exhibitions are bad. That would be nonsense to say something general like. Uh, uh, I okay. Here's again. Thank you, Tegan. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying that curating in general is something bad. Actually, the documenta was an exhibition that I kind of like better than most of the people that criticized it um and also i've seen so and so many curated exhibitions so there's nothing there's, i'm not saying that every curated exhibition is bad um the only thing i'm saying is like like uh first of all curating was invented at some point so for everything that was invented at some point uh, one can ask how come it was invented and, and does it still make sense so or shouldn't we think about maybe different models of exhibition as now as curating uh took let's say over or close to 100 percent of all exhibition spaces one could actually ask oneself hmm, maybe we should also we should also try something out something different out again especially as our let's say media environment more or less calls for it, um, given the fact that on very, very few media, we exclusively have to deal with curated content. It's actually very rare. Um, but let's say in all in, in all kind of internet platform, every platforms, everybody is accustomed to uh, select her or his own um, own links and favorites. And, and from there, of course, it comes the question, how come that in the art world it's not like that? Or we have to deal with lots of exhibitions that have that kind of preset frame. And then there's the other bigger thing is with the art world is that the background that I have the impression uh, that what, what used to be an equilibrium, or at least somehow an equilibrium between the public art spaces and markets um, is out of sync, and <clears throat> curating is part of that. Uh, part of the takeover, namely part of the takeover of the markets of the uh, that the mar part of the takeover of markets of the exhibition making. That means, like. Um, that curators become more 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 dependent on 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 markets, uh, and given the fact, that depending that on how much their budgets are slashed. Let's say, as long as we have public institutions with budgets that uh, give curators a certain type of freedom in choosing what they want to what they want to exhibit, uh, they also can make that choice. But uh, during the within the neoliberal phase, let's say of the last twenty years. As in all other budget, also the art world, the art institutions budget was slashed, um, and that leads to a situation in which the curators of these very institutions get more more dependent on markets, this and on galleries. Actually, what I know is an example from the Venice Biennial, from the main main exhibition at Venice at the Venice Biennial, that um, friends of mine were invited to show uh, but uh, given the fact that uh, the exhibition was lacking the 
the money in order to transport the artwork and also to finance the exhibition. Uh, they asked the gallery to, to pay for it. When, when the gallery said, no, we can't afford, uh, they were disinvited. So they couldn't take part in a, in a biennial. And I think that is a very normal process. Um, it's it just it just looks like looks different now we still we still live with the with the fantasy that uh, something like the documenta or the doc and or the venice biennial but the document is somehow the case because there's still a budget there but hmm, also not enough uh but that these are independent uh independent uh exhibitions which is not uh, which is not really the case actually they depend very much on the on the help of the uh, of the collectors and that is what um so to say brings the whole system out of balance meaning we have we don't have a different type of judgment but basically we have one type of judgment which is the collector's judgment, and everything else is kind of uh, depending on that. Let me read that Terence has a question. As you've seen with this year's documenta, the unregulated of curating is pretty appalling results. Key point curators are not administrators, and that's something that needs to change. Um, Terence, can you explain, you want to explain a little bit what you are, um, just what you are? Should I get this? Uh, no, just what I meant was, um, the amount of scandal that's uh, been around the, this year's documenta, particularly like with this uh, attempt to give something back to Greece by hosting half of it in Athens. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, like, it's something to take into consideration. Okay, so, I mean, this is, I'm not trying to deviate too much from what you were just saying, but I think we need to take like contemporary art as two, uh, very, there's two very separate sections to it. There's the part that relies on uh, public money. And then there's the part that exists within the market. And those things are, uh, they're two completely different case studies. So if you, if you look at the contemporary art in terms of like the documented style of things, and that's obviously quite different from the, um, the Venice Biennial. Um, so something that requires massive amounts of public money, that in itself is like um, a, a type of uh, myth-making, yeah? Because it's, 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 it, it, it's big, it's, 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 it's more blockbuster than blockbuster. Um, but the, the the thing that's common between the contemporary art is in terms of like the uh, actual sales market and collectors and in this um you know this contemporary art thing of, of documenta is that they're uh, unregulated there's there's no uh, as this, this is why i meant when i said that um curators are not administrators they're not managers they're not uh, or they're not they're not um they're not administrators or they're not uh, mediators you know and these are people who need to be heavily heavily involved in these processes because I, th I mean, I take public money to be something that's really, really, really serious. And when it's like handled in a way like that, this is completely damaging for any sort of uh, political traction or anything that art could ever have, if possibly have that. So that was the point I was making in terms of like uh, curators are not, this is just a phrase that I've had in a discussion with someone this year. And like the key point we took from it is that, you know, curators are not administrators, despite the fact that they're, um, they're, they're put on pedestals and everyone wants to be one. But um, as I, it mean, I mean, you're, you were, uh, you you know quite a lot about documentaries as well, Stefan, so maybe, maybe please, you know, feel free to counter, but I do think that like, it's, you have to think about it from the public, you have to think about it from the vantage point of what we want contemporary art to do. And you also have to think about it from like the vantage point that, uh, you know, it, art is something that needs to uh, please the public, you know, not just the cosmopolitan, all socially engaged uh, new institutionalism side of things. I mean, it needs to uh, be justified in terms of a budget um, that doesn't end up with like, you know, five million in, I mean, how, I mean, I know that, um, uh, Adam actually did a talk in uh, Berlin last Friday. Um, yeah, I which, went there. <laughs> that was an interesting um, spectacle because this is like, uh, I mean, when these things happen in in everyday nine, um, you know, nine to five or whatever, a uh, business like that sort of thing is not tolerated. And it's, it, 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 I mean, all this stuff it comes part and parcel back to this thing of like the curator as an artist who's ego driven and just. Um, there's like a trail of invigilators behind trying to pick up after them. Um, and this is, it's, I mean, it's very, very, very damaging. So like a certain amount of rigor and accountability, uh, I think really needs to um, take place a lot more in uh, contemporary art. And I think that's like, it's one example of how document uh, is, it, it should be considered scandalous in my opinion.
for what well, I'm I, 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 I don't think I really agree. Um, I mean, but um, the question is the, the, actually the question is tricky. I'm not I'm not saying that it's that you should be that you should be fine to spend five. It was five point three million to spend five point three million million more. But okay, let's let's get back to the, the to the details. In fact, there was that discussion. Um, three days ago, no, last Friday, um, with Adam Shimchik, uh, then there was Hans Christ, which is the curator of the Württembergische Kunstverein in Stuttgart, small but very good Kunstverein. Actually, the, the funny thing is that uh, these two curators, uh, Christ and Iris Dressler, which I regard as very good curators, uh, that was the there was where the heaviest discussion took place about my article, and that was also on Facebook where I was accused to sound like right wing, uh, like uh, like right wing people. This was so to say that was the curator curator curators fraction that always do kind of leftist political work and actually very good exhibitions. I like them. I, I really like them. Whenever I'm there, I'm, I go see what they're doing. Um, and so he was he was sitting on the panel next to Adam Shimchik. And Adam Shimchik, as, as you may know, has a very cynical position about the whole thing. He says, okay, whatever. Um, one shouldn't, shouldn't make such a fuss. And he thinks that it's quite necessary that uh, those kind of administrative calculations become a bit more colorful. And if the color is red, it's also fine. Uh, so red numbers is totally okay. Um, in the end, uh, there were uh, at the discussion. One point was that they now they fired the administrator. So she had not didn't fire her, but she had to leave, and she left. She's going to leave. Uh, and at the cool and is her name, and they're going to restructure the documenta. And it in the worst case. Uh, that could mean that the documenta loses even more of it, its its independency. Um, so, and that's <clears throat> that's actually the game that is being played. It's a different it's a it's a different game. It's not really about accountability, but it's about making it's the neoliberal game. It's about making uh, public infrastructure depending on markets. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. And in the very moment that the documenta is going to be changed, maybe that happens. One doesn't know how exactly. Uh, from a publicly funded thing to a for-profit exhibition making company and that's in the making it's exact it exactly is a step even further to that um and there's okay i, I the, there's actually from where the questions arise the more the curatorial system is make made dependent of the how to say of the collector's money the less the, the sort of the less independent judgment we have, hmm? and the, the the problem is so to say the 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 unique force of the collector's money the only remain the, the only remaining force within the art world that drives the whole that drives the whole thing in the direction that is um, let's say publicly detrimental because it's you taken you were saying that the public should have more of a role but actually the public doesn't matter. Uh, the art world is one of the few cultural fields where the museums, they still count, of course, the, how many people come there, but for the market and for the choice and for the selection criteria of which are the artists that are to be shown, uh, the public doesn't really matter. And that's where I, where, where I would put the curator. The curator is part of that game. Mm -hmm. The curators that are depending on the on the collective money are actually transmitting a collector's choice to a wider public and then they just fulfill the task of uh, how to say convincing the public that this choice is in its best interest that, she, that this is the choice that has to be made about what is what is to be seen in the art world um, and they can perform it as however they want as long as they're depending on the collector's money uh, they how to say there's a tacit drive it's not an explicit drive but there's a tacit drive to impose a certain let's say selection criteria on to what is left of the public one could of, of course say okay the public doesn't matter at all but this is another uh, another discussion the public is so, it's somehow somewhere in the background it must still be there actually economically i don't i don't know i don't i don't we know why one needs the public. Well, maybe one could even do completely without. But then, the the public is still something like a like a val valuation of last resort. Um, that's also 
one of the things whenever I whenever I talk to whenever I talk to curators, they say, okay, but um, <clears throat> it's true we're having our discussions and we're depending on the we're depending on money that we receive either from galleries or from collectors, and receiving the money from galleries means that you indirectly receive it from collectors. Um, but still, we try to mediate. We try to explain the public why we do this and these choices. We do all the programs for people to understand and whatnot. But I think that whole mediation debate is part of the problem and not part of the solution. Uh, because like with any, let's say, political dictatorship, um, the decisions that are not democratic have to be mediated. That's the way how to communicate them to a bigger public. And so mediation is part of the, how to say, non-democratic uh, government that sets the rules against uh, against any judgment that could come from come from a wider public mm. the same actually the same the same problem we also encounter with uh, with uh, with our criticism mm. it's very clear that if you write in one of the the big papers you write our criticism is that there's no direct involvement of the no, no, there's not a direct connection of the of the art critique to the galleries, but there's an indirect connection which is clearly runs along the lines that okay we should somehow cover galleries that um, pay the advertise that fill the advertisement pages of our of our magazine. It's not a one to one relation, but it's a on the long term. If you keep advertising, you're also going to get the review. Mm -hmm. It's a more tacit, is a more, is a more so to say, hidden, um, hidden system, and it's also all very well understandable. But it all helps to um, leave the art production only to one position of ultimate judgment, which is the collectors. And of course, the collectors don't have a don't have the the the, the collectors are also competing. I'm not saying that there's one collector's judgment. That's not true. Mm. The, the collectors are competing, there's different collectors, they collect different things and whatnot. Um, but there's no other force within the art world that can compete with the collectors as such. So the, the, all the difference that you have there take place in one playing field, which is the field of the very different collectors that have different setups of how to, uh, of how to uh, value art world, uh, the, the artworks. And that, on the long run, um, then from there we can go to another issue, which is the uh, the how to say it, the general economy situation. On the long run, puts the art puts the art world in a very how to say a very troublesome corner, um, because if at the same point, talking about big economy, at the same point we have a. Mm, stronger and stronger division of the society into those who have and so those who have not, the 90%, 99% on one side and the 1% of the other side, mm. the more the, the, the decision that collectors make on which artworks they buy and like and whatnot, it's becoming, it's, it's turning out the art production into a culture of the 1%. Mm, which then has to be communicated to the rest of the 99%. It doesn't even, of course, they never succeed with the 99%, but it's something, it's a very elite, it, it turns art production into a very elitist cult. Mm. Um, that is then, so to say, um, theoretically loaded with lots, lots of cultural... How would, how would you call it, with, 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 with cultural significance, with cultural meaning. Um, but in the end, remains a representative of this, of this small cultural section. Uh, and they're also looking back to history is some, is the, the fact is that some, that there's some, that is, this is not, this is not something entirely new. Of course, we had that before and the uh, very much of the, let's say, Renaissance feudalist art production worked along those lines and still there were lots of good artworks. Uh, the, the question is whether, uh, whether in other, our political times, that kind of new feudal, approach to cultural production uh, is something that can or should be maintained uh, or should be uncritically uh, taken. 
for a longer period of time? And I clearly think no. And I also think now going back to the going back to the 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 you no. Know, old equilibrium that we have that we had where there was ideally so to say we had state funded group exhibitions like the documenta with independent curating and we had uh, curated that we had the collector's culture um, and the two were developing in a different direction for some ways and then there was the there were all the complaints that we have artists that so to say have adopt to have to adopt to two different frameworks uh, because we have the biennial artist on the one side, the biennial, biennial curators artist on the one side, and the market artist on the other side, both don't have anything to do with each other. That was something that one, one still could uh, say for, let's say, the 90s maybe, when there was more money put, when the, when the curators had more money at their... Um, and the, when the, when the neoliberal, so to say, privatization efforts were not were not yet taking place to that de to that degree, um, but now, I would say, since in the last decade, uh, we're seeing much more of a how to say unifying movement, which is not a unifying movement that both fields meet, like that there is the curatorial field and there's the collector's field, uh, but actually that the power of the curatorial field crumbles due to lack of funding due to the dominance of the of the collector's field um, and in that respect art world lost its balance and what is completely left out of course and what was left out always and also from the beginning <clears throat> is any public judgment and now it even matters less than less than ever um, no, no, actually not less than ever, because we have to have, we also should have a look back at modernism and how, and modernism created a situation in one in which it was the, the, the public judgment was something of a counter indication. Mm. It was, that was even worse than now the situation. Um, so now this is, this is basically the, a short description of where my concern stems from. It's not, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, our production is futile. I'm not saying that curating is bad. I'm also not saying really that the market is bad. Mm, but I'm, I'm the, the, the point, the, um, the main point is to say, if you want to have an art production that has a more general public, how to say, significance. Uh, then there has to be a different force uh, that puts that opens the possibility of a balance towards the markets, and it's very clear that we cannot we cannot simply say the states should get back in a, into that position, um, because for that matter the the whole ideology of the neoliberal state would 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 have to would have to change. Basically, we would have uh, we would need um, so to say, Corbyn would need to be successful uh, all over Europe, and we would have to, we would rebuild the re rebuild the state as we had it. Uh, that's not. I mean, even if it would be nice, it wouldn't. It's not. It's not an option that we can easily count on. And I think it's also not. It's also not the option that we really want. Um, I mean, for the political for the political side, yes. For the well, maybe not. Um, but the option that one that is that I would say is much more intriguing is to give the public back a certain type of voice and that is that's actually the, the the point that i'm that i want to work for in the or the one that i want to work towards in the uncurated exhibition um we want to discuss that starting point briefly and then figure out how to continue comments questions I I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. I was actually just uh, working on this um, on this text and and looking at the recent comments on a book published by David called Art and Value. I don't know if it sounds familiar. Which uh, we, we, who is the author? Um, uh, is he's called Dave Beach Beach. Dave Beck. Dave Beck. 
Dave. Alt and value, alt. And then V for Bravo, double E, C for Charlie, H for Hello, big. And um, yeah, brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and I I just got hold of two different sources that they are commenting on his book, and mm -hmm. I was um actually picking up some of those comments. I thought one of the comments. I thought it was quite amazing because it said that during these two decades, the amount of new museums built around the globe, I don't know if it's double or triple, mm -hmm. the entire global production of museums in two centuries. Mm -hmm. And I think this obviously in terms of like, if I'm thinking about curators as technocrats or the figure of the curator as, you know, as someone who, makes things possible, which will be the, the positive side, maybe, or something. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're thinking about the fact that, obviously, we have a lot of museums, because the format of the museum and the format of art passing via the museum, then the collector, then the sort of like very kind of like aural kind of glamorous kind of thing where things get really inflated in value, in value and then you can actually you know white wash all this money because it all goes together like for me the thing is like you cannot just say curators this or that it's like it's the whole thing that is just happening and it's happening all at once so obviously they need the museums they need the collections they need the so many artists they need the biennales they need, because otherwise all these kind of new amazingly massive way of creating value that is actually a very high one and that doesn't have to exactly declare certain kind of things so that, or into which you can input so much money to make money in a, something clean, then what, you know, what is the figure then of the institution mm -hmm. that knows that is part of that? And then what is the figure of us as artists and obviously of the curators, no? That, that you, you know that you are part of, of the whole thing. And uh, I was just thinking about actually knowing and being, being aware that we are part of something that is really loaded with um, hidden money mm. or yeah. part of the national money or invested for nationalistic or like, you know, promotion things for cities, etc. But it all goes in the same I mean, there's, there's the link to the book now here, and there's also on it's on arc dot. Uh, um, it's on arc. Also, we find it on on library genesis if you also can find it. So I have it already here, but I think yeah, I had, mm, I heard about it, but I haven't haven't read it so far. But the, to go back to the to the museum boom and. Uh, <clears throat> And the, the connected question, I think that that all connects very well because the museums that is the there's a new it's a new type of museums and it connect the 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 boom of museums of course connects to the uh, let's say of the the idea of the rise of the creative class and the idea of the the neoliberal idea that every how to say that everybody should in, should be in competition with everybody else, yeah. uh, and for that matter, also cities have to be have to compete, and cities have to compete to attract the cultural the cultural workers that uh, that well, so to say that that how to say the propagate uh, that that foster that transition to a uh, to a service economy and to an, to a creative to an economy of the creative class, and for that matter, you need museums. Um, and on, but on the other hand, these museums usually are built as kind of very iconographic buildings, and they're so to say from the building side, the architecture side, everything's fine. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, when you look at the budgets, the budget is almost non-existent. So mm -hmm. these museums can only house private collections because they can't afford their own collection. That's also not the point to have an, have an own collection. Mm -hmm. So these are just these are just like so to say what what could be called shell institutions they look like museums they look like yeah. former museums but they are not they're just houses that so to say give a cheap uh 
service to raise the value of a private collection. They're housing the they're housing the private collections, and the the two things go go together: the dominance of the private collection and the so to say, and the dependency of the cities uh, to use the dependency of the cities on these private collections that they have to house in order to attract the cultural capital. Yeah. So um, it's exactly an example of what happens. And then um, these thoughts can, can even be connected further. And the, the figure of the curator has exactly to do with it. Because the, 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 as long as the museums were working as with their own collection, the curating was actually, the curator was a, pretty stupid uh, job. The curator was the one who had to, that's where the, the word comes from, to cure. Mm? Yeah, the, conser uh, the conservator. No? Yeah, it was the conservator of the, of the, of the collection. So uh, there, was not, there was not much in, in terms of, uh, so to say, dealing with contemporary art. From time to time, of, of course, it happened. Uh, there were also very experimental curators, for example, in, in, in Berlin around the 1900s. There were the first, there was a guy called Peter Chudi, I think who was doing the first big museum exhibitions of modern art mm -hmm. in Berlin at that time. And he was super influential with his, with his shows. He wouldn't call himself curator. He was a museum director and would also call himself museum director. Um, and the point was, of course, to add those works to the collection of the museum. But then, so to say, with dismantling the, the collection budget of the museums, the role of the curator changed. And it became from somebody who was taking care of the taking care of the of the of the collection of the museum. It was some. It turned into somebody who would uh, run temporary exhibitions. Mm, he was basically in the the agent of the temporalization of the museum. From now on, the museums didn't need a, uh, didn't need and didn't have a budget for building up their own collection, but they needed somebody who uh, comes up with in one exhibition after the other. Mm -hmm. that were all temporary exhibitions on some topics and whatnot not uh, that would uh, so to say go in and go out, um, and the. So to say, the the yeah the main agent of this transition of the museum from a from a building that houses collections to a building that just does, does exhibitions is the curator. Mm -hmm. And I'm not I'm I, again I'm in in arguing against the curators. I would not I would not argue uh, that uh, I would not argue along the lines that each museum now needs its own collection or something like that. That's not that cannot be the point. Um, I don't. It's not that I care. I don't. I don't really care about that. But it's more. What what I what I care about is more to say that that status that we got into with this invention of the curator, of handing the judgment of what has to be seen to yeah. an autocratic figure. That's the problem that we're facing now, and we have to get out. We have. To, we, we we don't have to think about how to get back the old museum. That's not. Would be. It will never happen, uh, but one has to think ahead and figure out. Okay, how can we actually go? Uh, how can we go ahead, and how can we how can we rebuild a public art structure that uh, hands part of the judgment to the public? That's the point. Um, is it, is, uh, can I ask one thing? Yes, when, when, say, when you're saying you think about um, giving back the, to the public the, the, the judgment, I was thinking as well about, because the, all these issues, obviously that's why I'm here, they are part of all the things that I want to be studying and writing about, because I found it fascinating, because I'm really thinking that we are in a sort of like, era and that's just the beginning. Um, we so, are, so, sorry, I didn't understand, we are in a sort yeah, Well, we are in a new era, like... I, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, no. But then because, like, mm, I'm thinking, okay, for example, as I am an artist, no, and I am an artist, I'm, I start from dance, which is really kind of, couldn't be more like me and, my, and the body and the exploitation of my own body or something like that, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and obviously, as a performer or artist or dancer or communicator, I have um, a connection directly to the public. Mm -hmm. I want this public and I want the connection. So I'm not interested in just being, um, you know, 
I don't know, seen with indifference or, or whatever, or people feel obliged that they have to see me or something because, I don't know, someone is saying this is what you, sh you should be seeing, but I'm, I'm looking for real connection. And I think this is something that um, it happens it transcends into my practice as artist. I almost broke that from my practice as dancer performer. No? Mm -hmm. But I think in the sense of the curator, they are not looking at this. Uh, I think it's not their need because their need is more into enter into a category of excellence and superiority because they actually have, they are like making like at the same time pleasing the canon, but then making canon or maybe they relate to. So they are already probably quite just geared towards the other side of the conversation already by the just by the status. The status that they were given by by the very profession. Well, if you are already a curator, let's say mm. you curating, you want to be curator, or you uh, and once gets geared towards becoming excellent, becoming author, becoming neo philosopher that puts mm. together a series of artists for your own, you know display of uh, amazing intelligent capacity or something. Mm -hmm. You are gathering this conversation already because of his height, you know, you are already at the top. Yeah, yeah. Things to be appreciated by a sort of like, you know, it's actually a super duper collector or that. Or, so you are talking to the canon makers and you're making canon. And I think the artist will be someone who was more like the rebel, the critique, the, 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 the ones, you know, who wanted to break a canon maybe because they felt oppressed or something. Mm. You know, and in this sense, they probably connect to the public. Well, not, not maybe not everybody, but uh, I think that, 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 kind of, that kind of role of the artist, I think, is also important. Mm. I mean, as I, as I see it, I, mean, I don't know yeah. if I mean, I'm, I'm talking a little bit in fragments because uh, I, I feel intuitions, but uh, probably they are not very well constructed <laughs> yet. No, what I, what I, uh, it's, a, it's something about the profession, eh? because I'm thinking about the amount. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about, for example, Paul O'Neill, Bart. I'm thinking about all these like kind of people that I just meet that everybody's curator, like for I meet them like six years ago. And now when now they are presented again, now they are curator and artist, for example. So now this is sort of like claiming back that they were artists. That's interesting. When they, mm -hmm. they get the place, the, the sort of like the signifier and the, the relevance by being curators and obviously zero practice as artists because to be artist implies a practice, a day by day practice that you do indifferently of who sees or don't or this or that. And, and then suddenly, boom, no, I am an, I am an artist. So what I'm, from my point of view, I'm very interested of what's the claim as well. Apart of what's the role, what's the claim? Hmm. Especially okay, and, 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 and yeah, in, in, the, in the details, of course, that, that's something I cannot answer. That's just the one point that I think, uh, or I, be, I tend to believe that those roles are, how to say, the, the, the roles are not of individual choice. Mm? Uh, but no, it's the, no, 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 no. The, that's something given by the system as it, as it works. Mm? It's structural, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, there's there's some very strange rules within the art world that I think are very heavily affected by how to say by investment schemes, um, and one of the rules is the rule of the rule of the biography that you have to that you have to follow a certain biography in order to be collectible. Yes. Let's say. Um, yes. So you you exit from the art from the art school, and it's very clear you have that kind of three to five years period in which you can yeah. become a famous artist. Uh, 
And if yeah. you don't make it in within that period, it's very, very tough to re-enter the market. Now, and then you can still hope for something like the Louis Bourgeois type of thing that you <laughs> rediscovered at 90. And it happened now recently, you know, the Greta Bratescu, the Romanian artist that was discovered at the Documenta, and that is so to say handled back into the market but they have discovered at the end of their career in the in the mid career it's almost it, it, it almost doesn't work because it wouldn't fit so to say I would say the the, the collector scheme you build up uh, the prices and you um, gain on speculation mm -hmm. and you build up the artist and then you can you can adapt that venture capital model like uh, the venture capital model as in as in as in startups no? with a startup it's very simple you invest in them early uh, you invest in 10 of the 10 one startup is going to make it and you're done it's fine no? yeah. same thing applies. i think the same same the same strategies of investing apply also to artists and actually i think given that the collectors know these type of investing schemes from what they from how they earn their money it's just a, it, it's just the same the same type of strategy and the same type of portfolio maximization that allows them to invest in 10 artists one of them is go, one of them is going to make it somehow but okay <laughs> But yeah, and, and the whole the whole money scheme is fine. Uh, the problem is that uh, a mid-range artist, mid, so to say, not are uh, in the forties or whatnot. I see in, in very many of my uh, very many of my friends no, that are in their forties, and it's clear that if they haven't made it to the big market at that time, at that age, they will never do it. Because they're either they're underpriced, then the probability that they will never be never move up is very high, uh, yeah. and the risk and still there is the risk that they start to produce some nonsense that will will take their prices down. With those artists that are almost dead, the work is there. You see exactly what is there, and you know exactly what to be what to invest in because they're almost dead, and there's not gonna not gonna, going to happen much. So the rediscovery story at ninety. Huh? Can also happen. It's, can, it's, it's consistent with the financial model, you know, and and it's not. And so I think that also, let, let's say in the I don't know, like switching back when you're forty or fifty to become an artist from being a curator, is something hmm, that I can't understand. The, oh, well, they are not switching; they are adding to it. So that is what I found quite interesting. Is that. It's sort of like they are not afraid to say they are an artist. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, it's interesting because you started as artists, then you became curators, then you became known because you renounced to be an artist and to, and you were not getting anywhere as an artist. Then you became a curator, then you did a little bit of something. Mm -hmm. Normally picking up the methodologies of your friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> becoming, you know, really different ways of hanging exhibitions and this and the other. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, uh, now you're an artist again. So I found it quite interesting because now the biography actually doesn't say anymore, just curator, it says. Um, curator and artist, no? And I'm thinking, yeah. well, <laughs> yeah, actually, I don't. I don't have. I have some artists that became curators, uh, but not very many. Not very many that that work any other way. Work the other way around. I mean, hmm. well, I just these things that I notice because I pick up in these mm. things sometimes because of people I I happen to follow or, or see them explaining who they are, mm. and it. It was very interesting to see it, especially in someone like, for example, so relevant as Paul O'Neill, who mm. is this, you know, is very self-made and one of the most revolutionaries of the... Sort of. Uh, tell me again the name. His name is Paul O'Neill. Mm, yeah, I heard the name, but... Yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know, I think, I think people in New Center know some... He was a director of bar. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I and think I... Published a lot about curating this. I mean, obviously it's interesting, but again, it's one of the, he's been instrumental in making a whole thing about this uh, sort of um, curator as author, no? In replacing mm -hmm. as well the, 
it's like when all the artists arrive to the ideas of collective or relinquishing authorship, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you get also um, greater. Yeah, I mean, we should we should actually we should add, and we're going to do that also in the in the next in the next. Um, seminars to add a broader historical perspective to the to the whole thing because and um, now it's very it's very clear that we're dealing with all those con so to say contemporary redefinitions yeah. of the playing field um, yeah, yeah. and the, the there's actually some very interesting points that the uh, that so to say we can we can retell the story as long as our memory goes because as long as our memory goes we have an idea of how to say what is what is the social behavior in the background and yeah. what is the kind of roles that people were taking but it gets really interesting when we transcend our memory yeah, and, yeah. It, and so when, when we go back when we go back to other museum models to other models of exhibiting to other models of uh, of selecting artists then only with that with that broader perspective we getting uh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting we're, we're gaining some ground from where to from where to ask something different because then usually when 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 we when remaining in the in the so to say in the in the stories that we can tell and i'm, I'm I, I tend to do the same thing and i actually was was coming up with the whole non-curating thing coming from that stories but that made me yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit deeper into what is actually the beginning of curating and the beginning of beginning of curating was of course some how to say them some artists whose career didn't work out uh and then then they they how to say conquered that position of curating or they saw the possibility of that position of curating and one of the one of the most important is the is the is harald seaman who basically not invented modern curating but who yeah and somehow he invented he or he he took it to the he took it to the to the big institutions and made it uh made it um made it uh made it a big made a big thing but there's others before actually Harald Seemann wait stop Harald Seemann a Swiss uh, curator and he famously did documenta 1972 um, when attitudes become form yeah I mean yeah. Form show, and he also triggered the the so to say the reaction of of two artists against his uh, against the, the taking over of the curator. That was the uh, Daniel Buron mm -hmm. uh, that was writing l'exposition d'une exposition, which is a very short text. Yes, uh, can be. I find it. I found it online only French, but basically what he's saying is that from now on, uh, an exhibition is no longer about exhibiting artworks, but it's about the exhibition itself is the artwork. Yeah. The rated took over, so to say, the um, the autonomy of the artist. Yeah. Uh, that's a very important text, and then is the the other important text that, so to say, argued the, from an artistic perspective against that 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 empowerment of curators, is the um, mm, Robert Smithson. Oh yeah, uh, the cultural confinement text. Yeah, yeah. And we should make, well, look at these two texts. I'm going to. I have the book actually. I I yeah, I have to get it. I have, yeah. I have the book, but I, I will I will look at it with more time. Yeah, the Smithson is actually quite uh, open. Uh, it's uh, you find it on the in, in Robert Smithson. Uh, yeah, I find it. We find it on the internet very easy. Just Google it, and you have it. Um, well, what I'm Let's say we, we're digging deeper into that in in January. Oh, that's not. Uh, let me find it and put the link here. Uh, so, what I just want to do now is the is the outline of the history that we we should work through. Yeah. And uh, and then. Uh, a little bit of the idea of how I think one can do a non-curated exhibition, but okay. 
now we're having let's make a let's make a quick break like i would say for 10 minutes or so okay mm -hmm. uh, this is, we are one and a half hours on online uh, so a little break and then we, we do the rest of the session till 12 o'clock i would say okay, okay. Uh, uh, Stephen, i have here these uh, slides are these slides online only yeah. while we are online or will i be able to check them as well better with more time no, you have the slides are going to. I published the slides there, so they're going to. So you're going to find them always there. They're going oh, to. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. All right then. So I see you in ten minutes. It, we now it's twenty three or seven. Let's say at twenty three twenty, we're all back here and we keep going for another forty minutes, and uh, then we figure out what is the rest of the program. Okay. Everybody fine with a twelve minutes break? Yeah, okay. of course. Okay. Cool. Then see you little. <clears throat> While we're on pause, I think I found an article by Slate that talks about how the internet is has gotten slow today. But I don't know if if I can post it here on the chat. Perhaps yes. Because apparently everyone had problems connecting with Hangouts today. Yes. Yeah. So I was wondering if it was something that had to do with internet in general or with connection in particular. And it has. Because I had problems. Okay. Like with my internet connections. Yeah, and yeah. also you. It's brutal. Yeah. And also now it, it's, in, it's, in, in London, Europe, is the what? place that everybody's online, of course. Yeah. yeah, it seems it has to do with the law on net neutrality was approved by the American government some days ago. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, but I posted it on the on curated chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. The article is from two two hours ago, approximately. Mm -hmm. Lady Irtiri, sí, 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 es amazing. Ya. Yeah. Wow. Es increíble. Wow. Me lo dijeron. Amazing. And this has to do with this thing that's happening. With the with the control on the internet, no, no. Uh, I don't know. I I don't have the com the competence to speak about it, but it at least according to the article, it looks like it has to do with with it has to do indirectly with this. Well. <clears throat> what well, dispute is over peering. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
<sighs> What's your name? Flavio. Flavio, hey. hey. <laughs> So you are the, the coordinator from the new center for this? Yeah, I'm the moderator of the new center. Fantastic. Great. I'm happy that Jason caught me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like if I wanted uh, to 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 make, for example, if I say something like a t a ver, no. I'm writing. You're writing? But it doesn't come. I, some people has written something and then it comes out like a pop up. Uh, yeah. It, it, if you if you quit the chat, like if you if your chat is not open, it comes out and as a pop up. Comes, obviously, as text. Yeah. It's not that you can just like give some additional information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I was thinking. Okay. If you, if you have the chat open, it's no problem. Yeah. Okay, because there was this, well, I can pass this later to Stefan anyway. Yeah. Like a couple of links. Yeah. <laughs> so you're from Barcelona, you said? Yes, I am. But I live in London for so you live long. In London. Yeah. But then also is this very weird, kind of like I have experience from London like like when I was like 19 and I, like you know that Spain was not even part of the European connection so I had to wait and queues and you know it was like immigration sort of like complexity big time yeah and uh, so from living in that kind of regime to actually suddenly well when I met my my ex-partner to actually, you know, flying up and down with this new easy jet stuff, you know, like cheap flights. Yeah. And then obviously the younger generations that they got so used to that kind of Europe kind of, you know. Yeah, traveling with Ryanair or EasyJet to... Like easy Europe. And now we're getting all this, this mantle is so weird what's going on. So bizarre. What do you mean, what do you mean by dismantling? Well, it's getting dismantled because England is getting out of European Union. Yeah, of course, but only with England. If you have to go to Germany, it's just the same. Well, for me as a, as a Spanish, yes, but I mean, coming from England, I guess, as you come from England, then it's like you're coming from USA or something. Yeah, of course, because England is not part of the European Union. Exactly, and as I am living in now, in the, I will be living in the foreign country. So, yeah. yes. And also, in the same sense, when I grow up, I grow up in the sort of like Franco, Spa, Spain kind of. You grew movie. up in Franco, Spain, really? Yes, with the fucking modern. Oh my country. God, it must have been and terrible. Then, yes, but then again, they're all, you know, some of people, some of my friends used to, used to say, this is like, this is getting worse by the time. But again, we're talking about neoliberal times and everybody was distracted. And now we're yeah. back. Again, like all these problems with Catalonia, uh, uh, Spain, yeah. the fastest. The, what do you mean? What do you what do you think about all the problems with uh, with with the Catalan independence movement? Well, I think that uh, I understand totally the independentist. It's funny because I am not hundred percent a Catalan. Yeah, no. I can see from your accent actually. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, you have a really Spanish accent. Yeah. Not a really Catalan accent. Yeah. 
like with iron, <laughs> with a uh, house called burning iron, Spanish accent. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am half, half, no, I know, uh, and, but I totally understand their cause and I totally understand uh, the suffering and why they, there's this need to, to, to be, be yeah. To emancipate, you know, and I think we will be seeing a completely different scene if it wasn't because the like the the republic like la república española and the república española española recognized Catalonia as an independent state as another republic, and they will just going to restructure everything in a sort of more like federation kind of stuff and i think because because this got completely boycotted and then we we had all the fascists and the civil war as well the civil war yeah like, but don't you like don't you think that although it has an historical significance and although it has to do with the way franco managed independentist movement mm -hmm. during up uh, until the 70s mm -hmm. don't you think that the Catalan independence movement uh, does not offer a real social radical change in respect to the Spanish society. Yes, exactly. What has happened is that the the the, the Spanish. Uh, I mean, obviously, we didn't know. I mean, at the moment, there's. I mean, I am fifty-seven. At the moment, there's very little people left that they were alive when the constitution of 78 was signed but this constitution of 78 was signed and a lot of things were kept secret for example that we had all the military like really pressurizing for a lot of things uh, to not be signed and change etc but nevertheless catalonia got a very good deal so everybody yeah. was more or less happy. But the problem is that since the 78, a lot of things have been going on in the background. Basically, is that the most, you know, the society, the fastest people, everybody need uh, need to, to 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 develop in their in their line of thought. They hate Catalonia as an independent possibility because they will lose a lot of income and a lot of resources and they're always i mean it's some almost like something really bizarre there going on anyway so what i didn't even know imagine i didn't know that in 2006 the people from the fastest mm, uh, i have to unmute stephen because i yeah. i actually muted him sorry uh, can you hear me you're asking me. You're asking me. <laughs> I was I I muted you because I thought you were coming, but sorry. Okay. Okay. Um. Shall we so, start again? Yeah, <laughs> I'm back. But uh, you, I, 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 I heard that you were discussing that. So, and are there questions coming up? Yeah, we were discussing about Catalonia actually. <laughs> uh, about Catalonia. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> And the fastest and the, the whole thing. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a different topic. Yeah, no, we're not going to get into. I would, I would, I would like to join the discussion about the uh, about Catalonia, but we're not going to have that now here. Yeah. I um, was, just, I was just updating him a little bit and how come things happen that it, they seem to happen all out of the blue, but actually they were actually getting. You know, there were things happening before that make this situation so i was just telling him a bit about ah, in, in in catalonia yeah okay i <laughs> i wish i could have heard but okay, oh, okay. Uh, we will always have other moments okay so, like um it's very interesting to see it from an italian perspective because in italy independentist movement are generally right wing yeah mm -mm -mm. And of course, they involve the richest regions in Italy, like in Spain, because Catalonia is one of the richest regions in Spain. So the only parallel is, is about wealth, but in terms of politics, it's a completely different politics, at, at least in a way it's seen, because 
there is no real north of Italy as a unity. But they constructed this unity basically on the pretense that the south of Italy was stealing north, northerners' money. And they had to get independent because otherwise all the money produced in the north would go to the lazy southerners of Italy. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm a bit familiar with the, let's say, the Italian uh, situation because my my girlfriend, she's from southern Italy. <laughs> oh wow! Where and, uh, from from Puglia. So. Oh, from La Puglia. I I don't know La Puglia. I have friends, English friends, actually, that they they hang out there. But I I have some family from Sicily. Okay, yeah, okay. I love, so, um, I love, and Naples, I love Naples. Yeah, yeah, of, of, uh, well, ever, ever since I also started to travel more the, the, the south of Italy, and I'm, I'm basically I'm there three or four times a year. Uh, mm, yeah, okay, but this is a different situation. Let's not, <laughs> let's not, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's not get, get into, into that. We, we, we could force a connection to the whole thing because the, through finance and the global situation, of course, we are, there, there is some connections, but we're not, we're not getting into really not. <laughs> that, uh, with that. Um, now let's, but any, 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 so to say, seminar related questions came up or you were just discussing the Barcelona and uh, No, we were discussing the, about um, like other questions, but I, in, we, I don't think we have to waste time right now. We can continue. No, let's, let's, let's go back. Yeah. What, is that, what is the link that you were uh, posting there? Uh, okay, the internet is being slow. Okay, of course, with the, when once once net neutrality is all neutrality is off, we're going to have to pay Google and all extra some extra money in order to have these courses running. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. okay, let's um. What I would suggest is to just to give a give an outlook of what uh, what other what what topics we should cover and how we and then we can also decide which where we want to focus because there's the two there's these two sides the one the one side is how actually could could one do an uncurated exhibition that's the one the one big question so the practical question how do, how how could one how could one arrange for something like that? And I have some ideas that I want would like to discuss. And the other one is the the historical background that you find in the in the that you find more or less in the slides, and that we're also going to go that we're going to go to discuss. So I would what I would do is just to give a brief introduction to what this what the historical background for the whole thing is, because we're going to go we're going to go back there in more detail in January. Um, and then just to mention briefly how I in, in which direction the the how to say the the planning of a non curated uncurated exhibition uh, could go because I'm somehow I'm I'm already working on it but uh, let's get first a bit to the uh, to the historical part so mm, you all of you have the slides so I'm just going to kind of click through the slides and and uh, tell what, what is the what is the point of discussion and where, where uh, so to say very many aspects of that exhibition making are uh, connected in an um, in in a, in a, in, a his, in an historical way um, so what I'm what I'm going to propose is that we have if we actually have five different types of art environments which is the around 7, 1700 we have the we have a feudal form of collecting then we have in the 17th century in the in the 18th century uh, we have the birth of the bourgeois uh, type of art and bourgeois bourgeois type of collecting and of display also they are connected. Then around 1900, let's say that we have the heydays of, of modernism, uh, which according to my theory is connected to the invention of the museum that happens around 1800. Um, and then we are, one could say that there's a certain type of investment culture that uh, how to say that shapes a different type of display and that shapes a different type of artist uh, of artist selection and then uh, from there on one could say that there could be there's the possibility of a network based um, or platform based way of art distribution uh, that 
how to say that one should invent let's say you know? and that's actually the broader purpose of uh, what we're doing what the idea behind the whole non curating thing is um and now that uh, there's some some theory basics to the i i i <laughs> As one of the theoretical bases, I would try to to go into some simple set theory, like how you how you build a collection, what a collection is, if you have a broad set of elements and you have some selection procedures, and what are the what are the, so to say the the properties of the elements, and that that the the set theoretical ideas rely a little bit on the, on the Foucauldian discourse analysis because there's a let's say if one looks into uh, Foucault's archaeology of knowledge archaeology of knowledge <clears throat> yes all the whole idea of an archive and this idea of an archive is that the archive is not something passive but the archive is actually something very active and structuring and of course we have to a conceive of the collection as an archive. The collection is a single instance of an archive, but the art world as such and the art production is framed according to the, the properties of that type of archive. Uh, and that's why I think, uh, so to say, where, where a set theoretical uh, considerations are going to enter. Um, the connection to discourse theory is on slide number four. Uh, I'm going to build that up. How how it works? How that works? Uh, or I'm going to explain how that works. Um, and uh, how the different from there in slide five is how the different types of collections are built, and how they bring up then certain types of display. And actually, one of the most interesting things is to look into the these forms of display that are pre museums. Mm. Because the museum display is something that we kind of that we that we kind of accustomed with. That is the standard display that you find in every in, in every big museum. So to say, the old display how the how the collection is displayed. It has that typical museum display has not much to do with the with the curatorial display of exhibitions. Uh, but it's rather something that you find if you go to a historical museum of art with a big collection like out of the let's say 15th century to the to the uh, to modernism actually the let's say that the, the shifting point is between the museums the modern museum which is so to say the fulfillment of the classic of the classical museum setup uh, and the contemporary museum the contemporary is something different because the, the, cont the contemporary with the contemporary one of the basic factors of the museum uh, is changing which is the how to say the the dimension of time is looked at in a different way we're going to we're going to figure figure that out and the dim dimension of time of time as the dominant of the do as the dominant dimension was also invented around 1800 and was so to say the basic the basis of the de uh, to develop something like modernism more or less was also the basis for the for the fact that an artwork could claim to enter the collection by being something new the whole idea of something new or the whole idea of progress is something that is connected to modernism that it's by itself is again connected to the uh, to the archive structure mm. and depending also on that you have different different uh, <clears throat> modes of selection in those in four exhibitions which is uh, the selection of the the, the selection of the pre-modern exhibitions were partially run by experts in the 18th century that was coming with the birth of art history so the art historians started to take over that's something that happens in the in the 18th century and also with that the the the, the purpose of exhi exhibiting something changes it changes from uh, the how to say the role of connoisseurship to the role of education hmm? and before before that so to say the, the 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 figure of the connoisseur was something that was still connected to the to the feudal idea of ownership then in general the, these collections were also not meant to be public at the, at the point that they entered the public sphere uh the how to say the 
the expert worked as I would say almost um, hmm, how to say a discursive figure that prevents the uh, the public judgment to take over. Um, and then in in modernism or also yeah in modernism in early modernism we have lots of exhibitions that were done by that were selected by juries. The whole the whole history of the jury and exhibition making is actually something something very interesting interesting because they the juries come up from as art first the, the juries first appear in the salons. Um, and then they were taken over by artists and and given within the academic framework. So the jury is something actually that that starts in the bourgeois collection, and keeps going in the in the early modernist collection somehow. Uh, so it's not it's not that um, that the blocks that I was marking, like the feudal, the bourgeois, the modern, and investment and the network collections, are uh, like clearly separated but there's always intermediate institutional and organizational structures that bridge from one uh, from one mode of collecting on one mode of display display to the other it would be would be more simple if that if there was if, if one could really make these separations all as they come but uh, they're not always that clear uh, and then between the jury and the curator, one also has to think uh, whether there was something else. But the, the, how to say the the selection modes in the in the late nineteenth century is are not one hundred percent clear to me. I still have to I still have to do a little bit more reading because the curator only appears in the twentieth century, and I would I would connect the the curator to the how to say finance or investment collecting and the decline of modern uh, of modernism. Um, and of course, the, the 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 network collecting would mean uh, to find ways how to empower the user or the viewer of artworks again. Um, then there's something on art objects. What the 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 one big thing that we have to clarify is the um, is the very term art by itself that has a very funny history that very few people actually know. And especially, also art historians don't know exactly why their field is called art, um, and that is actually that's a, is, that that actually is a quite well researched and simple and simple explanation that I could uh, that we could get into a bit more detail. Now let's go let's get also into detail in on that uh, then in in January uh, because it has it's, it's all to say that the the when painters and sculptures were naming themselves artists it was something like a small scale neoliberal uh, revolution if you want to say that took place in around 1500 um, and that has to do with the organization and the structure of cultural work at that time um, then it's, the, it's about the invention of the museum and especially if you look at the museum as a part of as a type of uh, data structure, if you want. Um, and the, to me, the modern modernism looks like the so to say the you no, know, it's not the fulfillment, but the a result of that uh, reshaping of the data structure within which cultural works were assembled. Um, and the, the 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 basic general effect behind this, or the basic general general assumption behind is that, um, and this is again very Foucauldian or very discourse analysis, is to say that the actors in a field act according to how it is shaped by archival structures. Of course, there's always an there's always an involvement that and 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 a mutual. Um, how to say mutual influence on how data say data, data structures are shaped and actors are uh, actors are acting and then they reshape the data structures, but I would say that the defining one of, one of the defining elements is always the in in the sits in the technological or in the data structure itself, and of course if you look at if you if you give data structures that much of an importance the the how to say the current situation is a revolutionary situation insofar as uh, 
the accessibility of data and with that also the structuring of culture and also other data data changed considerably ever since we have the internet and this change is not has not not yet reached the museum culture uh, that still operates so to say on a standard of a how to say uh, of a of a single dominant data structure um even if it has if it has if also that structure has changed within the last uh, 50 or 60 years let's say um we have to get then i'm on slide 11 now we have to get done into the into the relation of finance and art and a little bit of that you find also in one of the articles that I've written lately that was about the post-internet and the post-internet speculative realism and finance. That's the free portism article that was out on Eflux uh, also I think last year or the year before. Yeah, I think it was last year. Uh, and that's if you like to read, to look at that um, background from the other side is this article here. Uh, it has is a two part thing. I post it here. Uh, I uh, uh, taken yeah exactly. Thank you. Uh, so we we can we can look a little bit into into depth there because it actually makes makes the the connection between uh, certain f a finance situation and a philosophical discourse and art production and art display or non-display rather um in some in some way the the whole how to say it, the whole idea of working on curating and uh, tackling a whole system from the from the point of the curator which is um, um, is very clear to me that the curator is not is not the strongest uh the strongest point in the in 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 the whole setup, let's say, no, it's very clear that the curators are not the powerful actors behind it. But the curators is the is the actors that, uh, how to say, that can be changed. We cannot really, we cannot really change the collector structure behind the art world, but we can change in some way the selection procedures behind art exhibitions. That's the that's actually the 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 point that you can tackle. It's not the most powerful point, but it, it has a certain power and is a, it is the point to be is the point yeah the point to be changed. Um, and the whole okay my whole considerations of the of talking about curators relates to that uh, how to say to that to the to the way I depict or you know, to the way I've I tend to get what uh, happens between finance, art, and philosophy in that article. So we're going to talk about that too. Um, then um, we have to deal with the word and the idea of. The contemporary. What is the what is the, the the difference between modern art and contemporary art? Uh, which kind of shift takes place uh, in between these two, and how the contemporary is connected to the curatorial? Um, then there is one very important thing that is the the, the technological. How to say the te technological framework within art is produced and how it is shaped, because there's if you compare art to other to other cultural venues, most of the cultural or other modes of cultural production, most of the cultural productions went into um, into reproduction. So and once you reproduce artworks. Uh, it is clear that you enter a broader market and you make this you make yourself also dependent from selling reproductions and that automatically connects the uh, the, the the these cultural markets to a larger public like if you look at cinema or if you look at music or if you look basically or, li or literature books they're all based on reproduction and they're all connected to a connected to a bigger public because they're depending on sales to a bigger public um, the art world has a very different position because at some point the the idea of letting reproductions enter was rejected and that is the uh, that happens at the birth of modernism so to say it's the two connecting two connecting uh two connecting things that shape 
how to say modernist art production is on the one hand uh, to adapt to a museum, to an archive structure set by the museum, and on the other hand, uh, to reject uh, to reject reproduction and to maintain a mode of production that is, uh, so to say, that keeps operating on almost medieval levels. Mm? Manual production of single objects that cannot be imitated, that must not be imitated, and that should not be should not be reproduced. Uh, and this creates the this creates a very how to say interesting technological situation when it comes to the um, how to say to the disruptive forces that were unleashed by the internet uh, because of course all the reproductive cultural forms went into crisis uh, when when hit by the internet because all these all these all these modes of reproduction as soon as reproduction is something that can be done that everybody can do as soon as you have digital data you can reproduce whatever cultural good uh, the the business models of the other cultural industries let's say were disrupted to a certain degrees of course they ke they kept existing but they have they're struggling no? and they're still struggling film industry book industry uh, and music industry were all affected by downloads and by copying mm? the art world was not in that respect the art world uh, operates on a on a very unique technological basis and we have to we have to how to say to clarify what is the what are the effects of that uh, of that the revelation of that techno unique technological situation um, that is something in the background uh, then at the time when I was writing that article post internet still was something of importance now it's, it's very clear that the time of the so to say post internet art and also one could also say second generation internet art is over and we should have we should have a look into what media art was or what media art still is what was the what it, internet art did in the beginning uh, and what post internet art was thriving on for a certain number of years and why it is why it is gone not quickly that these are some kind of interconnected interconnected uh, how to say interconnected uh, developments Mm, that we should look into and then there is the free parts and speculative realism the argument from the article uh, and then what we have what we confronted now with is uh, that and that, that's again connected to the technological setup that most of the artworks have a double existence if you want the double they, they exist at the same time as physical objects somewhere mm? uh, Okay, performative arts, not, but also performance arts exist as physical objects, no? Um, and they have a second existence in their either documentation or photos or in, on, in all type of data that are circulated on, are circulating on the internet. Uh, and basically we cannot really think of, an, of a monolithic idea of artwork that only consists in the physical in the physical layer but we always have to consider that there is another and uh, non-physical layer and actually there was some people proposed that uh, or have came up with the idea that these two layers of course are being connected uh, and are being connected in the way that artists produce works that actually are not um, so to say that do despite being physical that do not only focus on the physical layer but actually serve as uh, sources in order to generate uh, online an online distribution an online layer so that these that these two layers are interconnected somehow and that the physical objects uh, how to say are interrelated to the to the exhibition or to the to the depiction within the within the visual platforms. Um, at that point, it becomes kind of not so easy to 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 analyze what artworks actually do these days and how you how for example how can we uh, read the the last Berlin Biennial that was clearly so to say a last. Uh, last instance of 
online presence very much incorporated within the art production in comparison to the last documenta that was doing just quite the opposite. So you know, in, in, in that respect, the, document, the last documenta was very conservative. Was an was an exhibition that if you that so to say through Instagram photos doesn't really communicate, um, and it willful willfully did so. It basically rejected that type of uh, platform communication, um, and also there it's not it's not yeah. I would say the, the, the situation is still pretty open. It's unclear in which direction the whole thing the whole thing develops. Um, no, as no, I haven't. Uh, tell me about uh, as the, the the Sharjah website. What is what is special about that? I can't hear you. You are sorry. Yeah. Okay. Now. Ah, I was trying to find actually the the, the direct link, and then it's easier. Um, uh, the Sh the website of the Sharjah Biennial, the last one, no? Mm hmm Yeah, I not don't know how it's. Okay. Uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, I don't know how to write it, you know, it's terrible. No, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, uh, 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 yeah, it should be this one. I, I just end up seeing okay. one that is not, the, is Singapore, it's not Sharhat. Uh, but Singapore is a biennial? No, 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 no. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Now everybody's <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, at least oh, one second. Sharhat. Why am I not seeing this? So, but, uh, but describe us. What are, what are you looking for? But it's just because when you were when you were talking about this and also esto, that's it. Oh, yeah. It's just because the, I saw the way they were mm, doing the 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 website to me it look uh kind of you know uh, quite in touch with this idea of making everything alive on mm -hmm. a ver, i'm trying to hold on uh ah, mira, yeah yeah you got it we got it it's the same one yeah, yeah. the the charger no yes i mean you look you know like you know, as soon as you go more inside, they have like this little labyrinthic thing, and then narrative. And I don't know. I just when I when I saw it, I just felt you know, it felt very much like. Um, of course, the, the 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 big moment is the 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 moment to watch out for is. Um, how do I say? Inconceiving. Uh, uh, no. If you look, if you look at these both layers, that we when whenever we show an artwork, we have the physical layer and we have the internet layer, so to say, um, yeah. and they communicate with each other somehow. It the, the 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 crucial thing is how much the how the dynamic that happens on places like Instagram uh, is um, how to say is fed back into the into the exhibition space, and what is the relation of the physical exhibition space to the non-physical uh, internet exhibition space because it is obviously clear that the that the amount of people can that can look at an artwork is incredibly larger on the internet than what than who is actually going to the place yeah. um, and but that again that again brings up the question of the public what is the what is the role of the public in the in in those things um, and the behind is the question does the does the fact that so many artworks become accessible <clears throat> change the production change the art production yeah. or whether it's just a so to say whether it's just mirroring a process that remains untouched and that's still that that's still that's still open i wouldn't i wouldn't make a judgment by now huh? uh, it's it's unclear because because the but there's also one part of the of the modernist heritage uh, which consists in the rejection of the public hmm? there was and we all know the stories how the rejection of the public worked it worked by 
uh, the the how to say the scandalization. Mm? When if you look at the history, the art history of nineteenth century modernism, it was always about uh, how to say disrupting the public judgment or showing the public judgment as being wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was, and which was which I read as a sign that uh, the the difference between the bourgeois system of exhibiting, where the main focus was on education. Mm, and you had the experts on the site that's all to say were responsible for the education. Like when was, uh, yeah, the, and the connoisseurship thing uh, shifted to something that combined markets, exclusivity, and the new within modernism. And th from then onwards, you could read the public judgment as the contraindication. So the more the judgment, the more the artworks were going against the public judgment, the the more you could read it as an indication that something really new was born. And from that, you have to basically you have the replacement of the old master discourse, where you can do something very good, where you have some certain ideas of quality or whatnot, um, by a discourse that is mainly about the new and things were considered more radical and more new. The more they were going against the public judgment. So the public was in early modernism. The public almost became the public became a counter in, in the, the okay. The public judgment became a counter counter indication, and that kind of rejection of the public kept going on through modernism until it basically reached a level where the public didn't care any longer and where they had to steer against it. And ever since ever since that was that. That when one realized that, one had to go into the other direction and one focused on all these mediation programs, programs in order to get the public back in. So to say, re retrieving again an old-fashioned educational model that didn't that was was also counterintuitive towards modernism. So we have to think we have to also think about the role of the public. And of course, now that the public enters through the platforms, uh, let's say a, a new configuration of the public is is reappearing a, a reconfiguration of public that is not depending on education any longer. So the whole education narrative is also out of the place, the education narrative that was reigning till 1850, let's say. Um, and we have to also look at these, at, 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 that, at that connection between what is, how does the display work? What is, what is actually the white cube doing? What were the, what were the, the, what were the 18th century models of display? Uh, how did you try to, communi to, to, to communicate or to build up that type of connoisseurship idea? That is all, we have to connect all that on a broader, on a broader historical frame in order to figure out what, what in, in, at, at which position we are now. Um, yep. And let's briefly get back to the, get back to the slides. Um, there's the social media thing. Uh, there's one very important, uh, one very important moment is the, that we're also going to talk a little bit about is at the foundation of the modernism is the the idea of the timeline. That's also something that one could can approach very easily from a Foucauldian point of view. How come that uh, all artworks are sorted along the the dimension of time? Well, but that's great, also great. some um, some because it you find it within the collections. Then there's a there's particular moments when that kind of uh, first mode of display is um, is there. Well, um, Excuse me, can I ask a question? Uh, will not you consider this a historic um, tendency to use the timeline? Um, no, I think that it's, it's, it's so to say it's one it's one layer above. It's the introduction. Um, let's say. <laughs> I mean, depending on how I how I can understand you, it's the introduction as history as such, and that is something that that Foucault describes very well, and also Rainer Reimer, uh, Reimer Koselleck, a German historian. Yeah, uh, yeah. They say that in uh, around 1800, let's say between 1770 and between 800, 1830, you have the introduction of history in basically all fields of knowledge. Um, and you also have the invention of something called art history. You didn't have that before. That was brought up around 1717 in the late in the late 18th century. Um, and the, so to say, the role of the experts that were that were stepping in around 1800 were the role of art historians. 
and they started to sort, uh, yeah, to sort the medieval collections along the timeline. That was a very crucial step, so to say, that is shaping that was shaping the the environment in which art was produced for the for the I would say the coming two hundred years almost. But it's coming to an end thing, and it's coming to an and we see that it's coming to an end with very with very simple fact because it's coming actually to an end in our daily lives. Um, if we and with these remarks, we can almost we can almost end. I give some details about what where I want to go with the whole thing. And then still, but um, if you're looking at Google search results, which is our main how to say main way to address the archive, uh, there is no time. We get all the results, but we get we don't get any time frame. There's no time frame. Yeah. Huh? It's and, like everything. <laughs> Yeah, everything else, relevance and whatnot, but no time. So we basically Google the machine that that uh, that um, makes do with the time dimension in in search results. Okay, but this is this is basically the historical the 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 the, the framework along which we were going to look at the historical developments, and then, um, and what we still have somehow to decide is how practical we want to we want to have the whole thing. We could, of course, spend hours and hours talking about the historical, the 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 so to say the historical relations. But at some point, and we have to figure out how much we're going to focus on that. And at some point, it's also about the practicality. So if we say, I'm going to jump now a little bit because we're almost at the end of the of today's mm -hmm. session. Um, if you want to think how an uncurated exhibition can be done, then of course, instead of curating simply a selection of artworks, it's about curating something else, namely a process of communication, a process of decision making. Okay. And that is something that has to happen in, in social media and in social platforms. And then the big question is how actually can we uh, how actually can we plan that? How actually what? How actually can we structure that kind of process? Uh, these are the two big issues that the that the three sessions in January will be will be considered with the laying of an historical foundation and the mapping of a of a practical solution. Uh, how to how to figure it out? And uh, do you? Are we supposed to come with ideas or, or no? We just go along. No, no. We should discuss. It's all. It's all open to discussion. That's of course. We. Okay. Sorry. No. Well, I was just thinking about bits and pieces things that maybe I, I know, about transmissions. You know, moments where you get a sight and something gets. A little I mean, bit what's happening now. The same, I mean, I mean it's, it's happening in a formal way, but it could also happen in a, you know, we could all be walking or something, you know, or like, you know, or gathering, or gathering experience via a certain kind of interconnectivity. I, yeah. I guess it's a great, it's a great uh, area to find out as well for probably programs. I mean, what we should do, and I'm, uh, for sure, uh, first of all, it's all open to discussion. That's clear. Uh, but we should all, we should also collect other venues of where that kind of, uh, um, where that kind of social curating already happened. I know that some that some curators were working with it, but I have not not a full uh, list. And that's taken already posted something from Eigen's work from the Wildcat Strike. Uh, Okay, yeah, I, that that's like uh, the situation is yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we should we should, uh, we should try, but because I'm I'm not I'm not fully informed of who are all the artists and who are all the collectors, all the curators and all the museum and all the exhibition makers that were already working in that direction. That's something that we should we should uh, build up a list and collect a list mm -hmm. and uh, look at those look at those mm -hmm. projects. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, the one question is: What are we? What what should we focus on? Should we focus on more on the historical uh, on the historical trajectory, or should we focus on the mapping out of a uncurated show? I like the mapping out. 
that I think probably both are interesting. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I quite like the sort of dialectic or, or, mm -hmm. Then, um, can I give a, can I give a, an opinion? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I mean, I, I think we should focus more on the present state of things, but yeah. also like, mm -hmm. like links to the past should be done exclusively in the purpose of like mapping what an uncurated uh, exhibition could be like. Mm -hmm. Well, but that's my opinion. I'm not in the art world. I would just follow the the lesson of today. Well, now then, then let's do it like that. Then we start. We start uh, the next session in January with an analysis of where we are, and feed in that kind of historical arguments at some uh, for, uh, as they come. Uh, and but rather think of what is the what is the present. Rather try to figure out what is the present state. Okay. And how can where can we go from here? What yeah. is what is possible given the given the pres, present state? And the historical the historical chapters I just feed in where I think it's necessary. So we're going we're going also to leave the lecturing type of format, but we're, it's more an open discussion format where we discuss in which direction one can one can develop things. And I feed in the, some historical connections as they as they come and as they seem necessary. Okay. Uh, so I think we we finished. We're finished for for now. You feel welcome to have to check out the slides uh, because that saves us some time when uh, digging in historical things, and I can explain them at some point. But next time, and it's January eight, we meet again, and we start with we start with working on the present state of things. Fantastic. Okay. That's good. So then, happy Christmas to everybody and a happy new year. Okay, happy new year to you too. Happy holidays. Thanks for, uh, for everything. Thank you. I, Stefan, I want to pass you very quickly these two links because they are maybe a bit of a shortcut for you in case you will be interested to know more a bit about the Bay Beach. Yeah. And they might be interesting for your own research. On its own timing and etc. Et okay, so happy Christmas. Happy Christmas, everybody. <laughs> See you. Bye. Super. Bye. So, bye. 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 I add the links to the I add the links to the other pad, all the links that I find here in that thing. Ah, okay, super. If you have more links than uh, and more questions, just feel free to add them to the other pad. <laughs> Because that's why we were where we're going to look at. We have to subscribe to the to this um, into you into this place that uh, is in German. What is in German? You know, it's this place called In Slice Share. How can we belong to this? Uh, we we have to be subscribed. I think you. I think it. It should. I. I put it. Is it public or is it not public? Well, it's for me public at the moment, but maybe if I close it, then it will not be accessible anymore. No, no, we keep it open. We keep it open for the duration of the seminar, the slides. You can, I just keep it open and public. So uh, okay. no, you should be able to find it for the length of the okay. seminar. Mm? Awesome. That's, yeah. Okay, that's there. And stays there. Okay. Bye-bye, okay. everybody. Thanks for the... Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.